I don't know if you can hear me. I'm stranded here on this station. There's only a few of us left now. There's something stalking us. Something that doesn't belong here. It finds us wherever we hide. Adapts to every plan we have. And now it's hunting me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cinemarcade. This is the podcast about movies, video games, and the sparks that fly that when those two worlds collide, or the slime that drips when those two worlds collide. In this case, very slimy uh, couple of movies we're about to be talking about here. Uh, my name is Steve Guntley. I'm very, very excited because this month is going to be all about Aliens, starting with the 1979 original, which we will be covering today. Exciting new miniseries. I am all about it. Who is here helping me flamethrower out the ducks? Uh, J. Ben, uh, aka Ripley. <laughs> no, you're already claiming that. <laughs> well, you didn't even ask me nope, if I'm nope. a Ripley. Why are we flamethrowering ducks? Why wouldn't we flamethrower ducks? It's just a standard part of the job. You get in a duck, you flamethrower it. Oh, yeah. ducked. Oh, ducked. oh, you thought like quack quack ducks? I was like, man, Steve fucking hates ducks. <laughs> Well, you know, the aliens in this series share a lot of DNA with the average <laughs> duck, including the, yeah, I'm not going to talk about the weird duck uh, corpse through penis. I'm not going to talk about it. Once you go down that path, it's the way of madness. Absolutely. You cannot start talking about uh, corkscrew duck penises and hope to keep the podcast on track, which is well, why I'll never mention corkscrew duck penises. Y'all are welcome for me getting us started on this train, I guess. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Justin. Welcome, Justin. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm glad you all could make it to talk about, I, I said at the end of last week's episode, my favorite film franchise. I think I'm standing by that. I think uh, even when the movie doesn't totally work, I love it because I love this universe. I think the Alien series is so groundbreaking in what it's trying to do. It manages to be scary and exciting and science fiction-y and futuristic. And every movie, as we're going to see is a wildly different experience. And I think, I, I really love that. I think we live in an age when a lot of movies feel very uniform and very smoothed out. And these movies are not that. I mean, it is a vast difference just between Alien and Aliens. And then Alien 3 is its own thing. Alien Resurrection is absolutely crazy. And that's not even including the Prometheus movies, yeah. which we won't be covering uh, on this because there aren't any games for it. But um, so much diversity in this series, and so unique. The Prometheus movies are prequels? They are. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and kind of... Is there more than one? There's two. There's Prometheus and then Alien Covenant, uh, oh. which are kind of both in that same continuity. And I've got pretty mixed feelings. I've got mixed movies. feelings about those movies um, as well. I want to love them. Really, really want to love them. Um, but I have no problem loving this movie today. We're starting today, of course, with Alien, which was released May 25th, 1979, directed by Ridley Scott, written by Dan O'Bannon, and starring Sigourney Weaver, Tom Skerritt, John Hurt, Terry Dean Stanton, Yafet Kato, Veronica Cartwright, and Ian Holm. And yes, that is the entire cast, uh, not including the stunt double that they got to play the alien, who is a six foot ten Swedish guy, I believe. Oh, um, damn. Tall man. Uh, so the concept for Alien uh, is actually tied very closely with the first film by one of my favorite filmmakers, Mr. John Carpenter, uh, because John Carpenter in 1975 made an indie movie called Dark Star, uh, which was written by and starring a young guy named Dan O'Bannon. Now, that movie, if you know anything about Dark Star, it's famous. It's a, it's a comedy. Like, it's meant to be silly, but... Uh, 
the alien creature in that, because they had such a low budget, they decided to just lean into it and make that part of the joke. So the alien creature is very visibly a spray-painted beach ball with feet. <laughs> and it's very funny. Like, they get a lot of mileage out of that. But while they were working on this movie, Dan O'Bannon kind of had the idea of what would a realistic alien look like? You know, what, what could we do? How scary would it be if you had a realistic alien? And what sort of otherworldly effects would we be able to get from it? So he started working on his own script. It was originally called Memory. Uh, he worked on that. He got about 25 pages out of that before he got hired away by Alejandro Jodorowsky to work on his adaptation of Dune. Uh, if you haven't seen the documentary Jodorowsky's Dune, it goes into the whole crazy process that went into making that movie, which would have been very unique and very weird and probably unwieldy. He wanted it to be 12 hours long. Oh, uh, wow. It was going to be an odd one, but... Through working on that movie, which never came to the light of day, he became introduced to the artwork of a Dutch artist by the name of H.R. Giger, who makes these very trippy, very, like, sexually charged kind of surrealist monster paintings. A very unique uh, artist, really incredible stuff. And so he thought, okay, this is the guy I want to design my alien creatures. Obviously, this guy has some kind of sense of the otherworldly, and I think he can create something that's really horrifying and terrible. Uh, so they start pitching the movie. Uh, he and his uh, co-writer, Ronald Shusset, who is better known for writing Total Recall uh, down the line, uh, they started pitching the movie around. Uh, they were originally going to be in business with Roger Corman, and ultimately they got bought away by uh, 20th Century Fox, who gave the movie much more of a budget and much more, much more prestige. Uh, they hired a young British filmmaker named Ridley Scott, who was fresh off his debut feature, The Duelists, in 1977. Uh, I haven't seen The Duelist. This I haven't is seen the it first either. Ridley, or Ridley, Ridley Scott movie that I uh, was aware of. Obviously, he's going to have a pretty incredible run over the next several decades, up to and including now. Still working. Yes. Uh, Napoleon coming out this month. Uh, I don't know. I'm not too excited to see Napoleon. I don't know. I got uh, this. Just Napoleon's just sort of like a eh, like it, I don't know. No one's excited about colonizers anymore like no. it's just like it's like mm, oh big deal you wanted to take over other countries Ugh. and like it, it's it's got that walk hard problem you know of like oh he's got to think about his entire life before he conquers france you know like and there, there's literally a line in the trailer where Jos he meets josephine and she's like oh i think i'm the whole course of my life just changed and i'm <laughs> like okay come on knock it off anyway either way R Ridley Scott is an interesting filmmaker he's done a lot of great movies and um, this is him when he's young and hungry and trying to make a name for himself so the script was pretty revolutionary in this because all the parts were written completely neutrally so uh, along they they had no preference along gender lines or race lines which really opened up the casting possibilities and I think that's so cool and I think it's weird that more Scripts don't yeah. do that. I, I, I think so, too. That way you could just be open to who is the best actor. I'm not looking for a specific type. I'm looking for who is the best actor for this part. How uh, else are we supposed to fail the Bechtel test? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll find ways. Don't worry. We will find ways. Um, you know, and so I, the, the vibe that they kind of settled on for this movie, which I think is so cool, is industrial like working class jokes yeah, like I, it's space truckers uh, i really enjoy the working class um atmosphere that this show because it's like so much of science fiction is about the intelligentsia being like all yeah. intelligent and whatever you don't see the working stiffs uh and i really yeah. ad admire that about this film or it's about like the military aspects of it um like one of my favorite movies, Starship Troopers, mm. kind of parodies that. Yeah. Or, or satires that. Yeah. It's yeah. Not, it's yeah. It's not a full parody, but yeah. yeah, it's definitely riffing on that idea. Like, um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, they they got the idea actually from Star Wars because most science fiction is very, very like you like you said, J Van, like it's all about the elite and it's all very, very slick and clean and futuristic. And Star Wars introduced some worlds that are kind of like back worlds that yeah. are kind of like dirty and dingy. And I think they liked the idea of that. And they're just like, okay, so w what would it look like if you are just a blue collar person working in deep space? I mean, even the Millennium Falcon, like it's been modified to be a little more luxurious, but it was just a freighter. It was a they, junker. Yeah. They yeah. threw some better thrusters on and we're like, all right, let's fucking go. People can't stop talking about how much of a piece of shit the Millennium Falcon <laughs> yeah. is in every one of those movies. I'm like, I don't know. It looks pretty cool to me. 
Um, but I think having this vibe let them cast in a lot more interesting directions. Most of the people in this movie are over 40, which mm -hmm. is not really usual for a genre movie like this. Sigourney Weaver was the youngest cast member at 28. Um, but you get people like Harry Dean Stanton, who's just like a ragged little beef jerky of a man mm -hmm. who I just love so much. I mean, he's got an incredible face. Yeah, Fed Kato is an incredible beef jerky face. of a man. Doesn't he? He just looks like a like a stretched out like dried piece of jerky and he's he's <laughs> just sure. always so good. I'm sure he loves that description. <laughs> I'm sure he would. I actually think he would appreciate it. Um, but yeah, Sigourney Weaver, uh, this was basically her first significant film role. She had a cameo in Annie Hall a couple years before this, but, and, but she was already like a really respected theater actress. Like she mm -hmm. came out of the same acting class as Meryl Streep and like they were both kind of the toast of Broadway around this time. So she was kind of a big get, but either way, like the, the movie does operate under a little bit of a, uh, of a psycho style switcheroo where like the person you think is the main character mm -hmm. is not the main character. Like for the first half of the movie, it is really not clear that Ellen Ripley is going to be the lead of this franchise. Yeah. She's not a super badass. She is the least fun member of the crew. <laughs> She's like a functionary. She always, she doesn't want to let them in because it violates rules. Look. Like, but yeah, of course that's the one who's going to survive. And also, was she wrong? Yeah. She's never wrong. She's not That's wrong. No. She's not wrong she is, in this movie. She's never wrong in any of these movies, and nobody for, listens to her. I, I don't know if we're going to get to it, but like, is she, like going back for the cat? Mm, I don't know. That was a bit I of a... love going back for the... You got to go back for Jonesy. You got to go Look, back for Jonesy. sometimes you like your pets, <laughs> <laughs> and you take them with you. I, th You know, I would go back for my dogs. Like, I would go back. They would... 1,000% get me killed. Uh, Gunter oh, would bark. Rivet. A rivet would try and like lick the alien's leg, and uh, it would kill me immediately. But, you know, I would like to think in my head, can the alien would adopt them and raise them. <laughs> um, the alien kept letting Jonesy live. So. Yeah, yeah, it had no interest in killing Jonesy, um, which is kind of one of the interesting little, like, canonical nuggets this movie drops without ever really exploring it. And I love that about this movie. It never really goes into that. Um, but yeah, so they did, they did end up hiring on HR Giger to do all the artwork and create the creature designs, which kind of blend like Renaissance era depictions of demons with insect features and no small amount of phalluses. Let's be honest. Yeah. Like the alien is roughly constructed out of a lot of pointy dicks. Like we can, we can say that. I think that's, I think that's, accurate. I think that's easy to admit. You're constructed yeah. of a lot of pointy dicks. <laughs> Hey, don't insult my mother. It's a pile of pointy dicks. Um, but yeah, this creature design is so brilliant because we, as an obviously now, 40 years later, we know what the alien or the xenomorph looks like. But in 1979, all we knew was that it was a little worm that popped out of a guy's chest. We don't know that it's going to be getting bigger and like changing its form as the movie goes on. I love the way the little guy scampers off the table. Yes. <laughs> oh. oh, a little friendly guy. Uh, so I think that's just such an incredible design choice and the fact that we never are fully aware of what this creature is capable also, of. God damn, that thing grew quick. Yeah, it, grows it grew quick. very yeah, quick. It's a real and it did quick not need much nourishment. No, no, not really. Point. No. Uh, yeah, so this movie only cost $11 million, which was oh. pretty big back in 79, but like barely more than Star Wars. Um, and uh, it had some pretty groundbreaking special effects, which did win the Oscar for. Initial reviews were a little bit mixed, but almost everybody came around on it. Like Roger Ebert, when he first saw it, was like, oh, you know, it's, it's better than the average like monster movie, but it's still not that great. But, you know, 30 years later, he would add it to his great movies mm -hmm. column because he... There's something about all the imitators that came from this that sort of makes this one stand out. It makes you really see how special it really is. Uh, this grew to earn $184 million domestically. Nice. And, uh, yeah, it won the Oscar for visual effects. And it's since been heralded as one of the best and most influential sci-fi movies ever made. And when I'm... When I'm imagining my ranking for this series, like when I'm trying to decide which alien movie I prefer, it is always the biggest toss up between one and two yeah. like because they're, they're hitting very, they're both similarly masterful, but they're striking very different tones mm -hmm. and scratching very different itches. Uh, so I think if you are looking for something just, that's just suspenseful and just kind of pure horror, I think alien is a pretty perfect movie. Yeah. 
Um, and now, J-Ban, this was your choice. This movie was it your was choice. My and choice. This, was your, this whole uh, series has sprung from your mm. desires. Yes. So uh, why did you want to talk about Alien in particular? Well, I haven't watched it in a while, and I was wondering whether or not it will hold up. Yeah. Because, um, like, it just lives in my memory as, like, a behemoth of, like, awesomeness. And, uh, and I have to say, like, oh... My God, the production value! Oh, the detail! In this film. <laughs> so fucking good. The set design, yeah. everything. Everything in this movie looks beautiful. It looks beautiful to this day. Yeah. It doesn't look dated. It looks. You could like have this movie roll out uh, today, and it would still be exceptional. Absolutely. The, the miniature work uh, with like the exterior shots of the ship and stuff yeah. were pretty cool. Um, I loved the idea of the uh, the bridge being the shuttle, yeah, and being detachable. That was a super cool idea. It's great. And then the you don't get a lot of like direct in focus, like long shots on the xenomorph as it mm-hmm. does stuff. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. what you do see all feels pretty good. Yeah. Um, they're really smart in what they show you and what they don't because yeah, yeah if, if you'd seen too much of this like if it was too clearly lit or something yeah you would probably see the seams a little bit more and it may not have aged mm-hmm. as well but yeah I'm I'm with that's, you 100% that's like, part of the craft <laughs> even using kind of the retro future style like everything in this spaceship is using 1970s era computers so mm-hmm. very big loud keys and lots of like green text and very simple interfaces but even that just really helps sell kind of the grimy nature yeah. of this spaceship um, and and of the crew and of its mission, you know? Yeah. And I love how ridiculously ornate and complex all of the technology is. Like, yeah. the whole self-destruct sequence, like, I love it. It's brilliantly designed because, obviously, you can't have a, uh, a button that you can accidentally push. Yeah. Like, it's a very specific process of, like, screwing in, like, tubes and lifting buttons and doing all these crazy things. Like... Uh, I love that design. I love that the master computer is just this room that you have to sit in and hit a million switches. Mm-hmm. Like it's got so many little innovative little touches like that. Yeah, and I, it's just, it all felt right. Yeah, like there was no wall panel that seemed out of place. No way. Every single thing blended in, and it either looked like this is just kind of a blank panel. Um, with like cables and stuff running along it or like there's actual stuff here. Yeah. But all of the technology, all of the design, everything was very seamless. Mm -hmm. And it felt not only was it, did it belong there, uh, but it also felt like it was kind of lived in too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I loved how comfortable they were at certain points. Like at one point Ripley is... I think looking at the map Mm -hmm. and she's like kicked back and has her foot up on the console. Mm -hmm. Like she's done this hundreds of times before. Absolutely. Um, This is a job. They are, they are long haul truckers. That's what they're flying this massive, massive ship, but there's only seven of them on it because it's mostly like an ore refinery, Mm -hmm. you know, and their job is just to transport back and forth. So we have this idea of like, they're, they're going to this deep sleep, which is going to be a continuous, like, piece of technology throughout this whole series um you know it's the cool image of them just all like slowly coming out of it in the beginning and I, they have those great 1970s style touches of everybody like talking over each other at mm-hmm. the dinner table because it's <clears throat> supposed to feel authentic and lived in and like these are co-workers and they get along and they're ribbing each other and they're giving each other shit and you get a good sense of their personalities without needing to spell it out like we know that Parker Yafakato's character is kind of a rabble rouser. He's a bit, of, you know, he's all about the money. You know, he wants yeah. to know, are we getting a bonus? Well, Very it's, money oh, motivated. It's so funny. I think that's one of the things that have actually dramatically changed, like, in my perception of this movie. Because, like, when I was younger, it's like, well, dude, you signed up for it. Like, yeah. why would you get more than half a share? <laughs> yeah. And then I, now I'm like, yeah, fuck them. Give them, ha- give them a full share. He's, he's out there in space yeah. risking his life. And you you get the whole you understand the concept and the motivation of why they would investigate this derelict ship too because because they are low level functionaries and the company told them to and they're getting more money off of this yeah. they are blue collar they need this money knowing what you learn later on 
it makes even more sense because people were a little reluctant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, there was one person that was also helping push everything along. Absolutely. And uh, they were making some of those decisions happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which and was a very interesting little thing, too. So for a little bit of background on my experience with the Alien series, I've talked about this on, like, multiple different podcasts in the least these last couple months, and we're going to get to it a little more in a few weeks. But my very first horror movie that I ever saw ever was Alien 3. Oh. Saw it at a, uh, a birthday party when I was, like, 9 or 10 years old. And Hell yeah. It scared the shit out of me, and I became obsessed with this whole franchise. So a few years later, they released a VHS, like, box set of the Alien trilogy. Mm -hmm. And I got that for my uh, birthday. I got the tr the trilogy of trilogies. I got Star Wars, Die Hard, and Alien. Yeah, nice. oh, all the man. Fox box sets. I got all three of those the same uh, day. And I just became obsessed. But... For years, the only way I could watch Alien was on this very kind of grainy looking VHS tape, mm -hmm. which even a top of the line VHS tape is going to look a little washed out. So the whole sequence when they're exploring the ship was I was losing a lot of those details. You know, I couldn't really see exactly what was happening, which allowed my imagination to kind of run wild. Like, for example, when they find that big hulking like elephantine like yeah. alien like manning the gunner ship. Like, I couldn't quite process what that was. Yeah. It felt so surreal and so insane that, like, I was convinced I was just seeing it wrong somehow. Mm -hmm. And then you watch the movie on an HD DVD, and it just looks so mind-blowing. You could see every, like, rivulet in the design, like, every little bit and pieces of, uh, of this entire ship, which kind of made it become, like, my favorite segment of the mm -hmm. entire movie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> The giant alien is so impressive and it just creates this otherworldly feeling that you're just like, and that you're like in this sense of dread. You're like, this alien destroyed this alien. Right. <laughs> you know? And yeah. it's never explored. All we see is that there's just this guy, he's got this hole in his chest. And, you know, that's why, like, four, 30 years later, Ridley Scott made Prometheus pr primarily to explore who that guy was yeah. and what his deal is. And they didn't fully answer that. But again, I have complicated feelings about that movie. Uh, but, you know, going descending down into that egg chamber with that weird little like light filter with like the fog over it. And then the, sh the design of the egg itself, which has a distinctly H.R. Giger style uh, vaginal opening, mm -hmm. I suppose you could say, uh, with this fleshy face hugger that's made out of actual sheep's innards that they just like shoot at oh. John Hurt's face with like a pressure cannon like uh, amazing design like mm -hmm. you can't really see that thing and not think oh my god like it's it's clinging to his face it's breathing for him through mm -hmm. these little sacks and if you try and move it it'll tighten up so hard it'll crush his face yeah. like unbelievable design that's so cool you know so they try and bring him back into the ship Ripley doesn't want to she's the only practical person on the entire ship uh, but they flout uh, conventions and they get him inside. Ash, who Ash. like later on you, you know. find out why he's flouting conventions uh, because he's shady as fuck. What an incredible reveal. Uh, we'll get to that first. But I, first I want to talk about the dinner table scene. Uh, yeah. Maybe the most legendary scene of this entire movie. This scene was shot. With, the actors knew that that scene was coming. They read the script and they knew it was coming. But they didn't know it was going to be that day. And they didn't know what the creature design was going to look like. So, oh. like, John Hurt and the special effects team kind of, and Ridley Scott, they kind, of, they, they kind of organized it almost as a prank, but they wanted the reactions to be authentic from the rest of the cast. They wanted them to actually be scared by what was going to happen. Uh, and I think it was really effective, you know. And there's a lot, there's been a lot written about why this movie is so scary and so resonant. And they talk about this scene a lot as... For, like you could you could do a feminist reading of it mm -hmm. as like this is uh, this is a man who has been forced to bear a child against his will mm -hmm. this is a, and there there's the violence and the death that comes with it and there's something about it playing on male anxieties about um reflecting the way that they treat women and the way you know the society treats women there's an interesting reading on that um but it's just an effective ass scary scene mm -hmm. Uh, you know, he just starts coughing and coughing and then the blood starts spouting and this little monster comes out and it's a little bit cute, but then it scampers away. And uh, we just, you know, if you're seeing this for the first time in theaters, you just think that little worm is all you're going to have to deal with. 
We have no indication at this point. <laughs> You're like, bro and Shane. Oh, he's puntable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can find him. You can step on. They don't know about the acid. Oh no, they do know about the acid blood because the face hugger yeah. has yeah. that going on. Um, but yeah, so they, they they start hunting this creature. And yeah, and then we get the little bit of kind of the uh, the runaround here, where any sci-fi movie, the assumption is that the virile bearded captain <laughs> is going to be the lead of the movie. You know, the captain in every sci-fi mo- movie is always the lead, and the fact that he's like the second to die, second, yeah, or second third to, to die. die, like by exploring all these ducks and like using the flamethrower, you know, and that's when we first get a s- sense of oh shit, this thing has grown. <laughs> It's a very different monster than we got. That's a great little twist. And then even after uh, Dallas dies, it's not clear that Ripley's going to become the lead of this yeah. movie yet. Like, she's still just kind of like the second in command. And she's as scared as everyone else. Um, of course, we get to the Ash reveal, which melted my brain when I first yeah. saw this. Um, <laughs> like, he starts acting really twitchy and really weird. He starts trying to attack Ripley in this way like the, uh, and the, a really the, weird phallic like in like during that scene there's also pictures of like a half topless women and you're just yeah. like that's just such a weird image of He's have trying this robot to roll up a magazine and shove it down her throat like that is such a weird behavior and like it's clear through holmes like physicality that like something is going wrong with him yeah. but it's not until Parker hits him with a pipe and his head falls off and starts spewing milk everywhere yeah. that you realize that, oh shit, okay, this guy is not a human being. It was really funny earlier. I was watching it with uh, Christian mm-hmm. uh, and um, he Ash was drinking milk and he's like, an adult drinking milk, that means he's evil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's actually, that's a pretty good indicator, yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's such a great reveal because we don't know at this point that there are cyborgs in this universe. Yeah. Like no. they don't talk about it because why would they like, this is just a part of their daily life and they don't know that he's a cyborg, but that's such an amazing reveal for us to see that like, not only is he this vicious killer robot, who's like a double agent working for the company, but this design of this robot that he's full of like these like globes and yeah. he's like pumping this white fluid that's so much more disturbing than if he were full of blood yeah uh, and it's uh, Ian Holmes' performance here is really incredible He uh, and the special effects of them like putting his head on the yeah. table and like ah still so good uh, but you know the cast is gradually getting picked off uh, you know we lose well I think it's really interesting like the commentary on uh, capitalism <laughs> yes. in this yeah. film it's just like this company is so malevolent they like all they care about is getting this um, monster uh, for their research and they just don't care about anybody's life or limbs or or anything and it's just like it's such a like these people are so expendable uh and it's just so disheartening to to know that this company is so evil absolutely and uh like the thing the 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 moment that it triggers is when before the ash reveal uh ripley becomes first in command because Mm -hmm. now dallas is dead so she goes and she uh, goes to the, the mainframe mother and is uh-huh. like, yo, what the fuck is happening? And then finds a thing that is hidden because it's it's supposed to be only for the science officer, which right. is Ash. And so she does an executive override and it's basically like, yeah, uh, security officers orders are to bring back this under all costs all other priorities are suspended and it's like wait a minute and then at the end it goes all crew is expendable and you're like oh okay that is a great reveal and yeah you're exactly right jay van it's this great capitalist like uh uh, commentary because Waylon yutani the company is going to be the big bad throughout Mm -hmm. the rest of the franchise like they are single-minded in their goal and that is always to capture a specimen of these to create a some kind of bio weapon which apparently no one really talked about this being a bad idea like they've been given multiple chances to see how bad of an like idea this is, this is it just seems like an exceptionally stupid idea because you're like how are you going to control this bioweapon like how like like this is complete total warfare you have explosives if you just want to kill everyone just use explosives 
And you have to think that at some point the cost of both in life and in money of trying to obtain this specimen is far outstripping any uh, value you can get from selling it. Well, because there's also – there's more than just selling it, right? There's doing research on it. Yeah. There's learning that acid, learning more about all of that stuff. Yeah. And because uh, it's like this is a naturally generated acid. So uh, there are there are two kind of threads that they always dangle at us in all of these alien movies and never – they've never really pulled the trigger on it. One is seeing the alien homeworld, which we've never seen. We don't quite know where they yeah. come from. And two is the aliens getting to Earth. Mm -hmm. Those are two things that still have never happened in the series, uh, unless Spoilers. you count uh, alien, alien versus, versus predator, predator, which is non-canonical. Um, but you know, they welcome non-canonical. Non-canonical. Yes. Um, I, I don't know. I really love the Alien versus Predator universe. <laughs> it's pretty fun. No, look, it's it's definitely fun. Uh, the first one especially. I think the second one is wretched. It's literally unwatchable because it's so dark. Like, you can't see anything that's happening. Mm -hmm. But the first one is pretty fun. Just like, turn the gamma off. No, literally it won't help. I, I, I challenge you to try and watch Alien vs. <laughs> Predator Requiem and uh, see if you could tell what's happening because I genuinely could not. But uh, those are fun movies. But, yeah, so canonically those are two things that have just never happened in this series. And there are two things that um, – I, I think it's a good idea to keep dangling that, you know, and not really committing on both because there's only so far you can go. I don't know, like, what an alien homeworld would look like because, like, they just, like, maybe they don't kill lesser, smaller species. Like, and so, but wouldn't they, like, they, they're they so murderous. Yeah. They're like, they're like wasps. You know what I mean? They're just like how... A lot of pointy dicks. <laughs> just a whole bag, a bundle of pointy dicks. But yeah, they are literally parasites, yeah. you know? And Prometheus kind of answers where they come from. You know, we see that the engineers have like created them. So that might be the only answer we're ever going to get as far as an alien home world. Uh, but that is the important thing is that anytime you find these eggs, it's not where they're from. Like they've been placed here by someone or they've been like created for some purpose. And this movie is so uninterested in any of that, but it does whet your appetite to explore oh, some of these ideas. I think I just, I think I just figured out the this movie. Okay, they're space truckers, mm -hmm. and uh, the aliens are space hitchhikers. Ooh, Ooh. yeah, kind of. Yeah, and so they're sort spreading of like themselves around via hitchhiking. That is kind of yeah. That's that's kind of it. You know, they are they will glom on to something. And they do seem to be only designed for this one purpose, which is just killing everything. Uh, yeah, it's not even like uh, eating and like, getting sustenance. Yeah. It's just like, nah, fuck that guy. So like the, you can make an argument that they're, they're meant to sort of like a chemical purge or something. You know, mm -hmm. Prometheus raises a lot of these ideas that, that are very interesting and not fully successful. But again, we'll get to, we won't get to remember Prometheus, <laughs> but you know, we'll... I, Check it out. I would say watch Prometheus. I think it's worth watching, right? Like, I think it's worth watching, even if it's it doesn't totally work for me. Really dull. Okay. Um, yeah. Like I like I watched it because I love the alien backstory, and I just feel like they give you ten percent of what they promise. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even combined with Covenant, which kind of does its own thing and doesn't really follow up on a lot of the threads left by Prometheus. It's it's a frustrating experience that you has moments. Charlie's their own though. You get Charlie Theron uh, mm -hmm. unable to run sideways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the big complaint about that movie. It's like she could have gotten out of the way of that big donut. Um, anyway, back to Alien. The crew gets pretty much all picked off except for Ripley. Ripley's the last one standing, and the, and the cat. So Ripley decides that she's going to get into the escape pod. She's going to set off the detonator, blow up the entire facility to make sure that it's dead, which leads to like a really intense, mostly wordless like kind of 30 minute chunk yeah, of the movie. Speaking of like the they use silence so effectively. Like the soundscape of this is so interesting and like and some of it is just so beautiful even though like you like you're like really why is it raining on a ship? Right. Mm, like mm, Yeah, they didn't yeah. tighten any of those pipes. Uh, yeah. they didn't tighten yeah, like this this guy has a moment of a, uh, tears in the rain uh <laughs> like a sort of like well, moment and did you're you like not Catch that? When the alien comes down behind him, it's dripping out of its mouth clear liquid. I think he wasn't under rain; he was <gasps> under the alien. No, the, that, the that, alien... that that was a rainy that was a rainy room. It was. Okay. I think it was like a leaky pipe, and I think the alien was underneath the same 
height. Like, because okay. I had that thought the first time I watched it. Like, oh, they were sharing a moment. Spit? Yeah, yeah. They're drinking from the same fountain. But either way, this is a very wet, slimy monster. Mm-hmm. Um, so it constantly seems to be generating its own goo. Uh, <laughs> but but Brett was drinking from, like, broken pipes. But, yeah, they, uh, it, it helps with the industrial nature of this thing that, of course, it's not, like, a fully put together I'm not. Ship, I'm not saying yeah. I hate it. I'm just saying that... Uh, to be like you're like mm, mm, a look, little bit of somebody not a somebody somebody let cool override reasonable and i'm not mad at it yeah, yeah. And i'm mad at it no I'm, I'm there for it i'm there for it yeah I, I, and the the sound like you mentioned the soundscape of like this final section where ripley's getting ready to destroy destroy the ship it's just this overwhelming like blaring of sirens and flashing of lights you don't yeah. hear any music but it's just like her breathing and panting and struggling and the noises of this industrial facility going up a lot of hissing yeah lots of hissing hissing. lots of smoke and it is a nice choice for ripley to go back for the cat like there is uh the the book about screenwriting that's called (laughs) save the cat which is uh total crap like don't put any stock in save the cat but it is the kind of idea that you need to make your character do something likable like that like and that's how you can get away with a lot you know and ripley is not necessarily a likable character up to this point they make her very stern and kind of uh kind of know it all a little bit but uh giving her this humanizing moment of saving this cat um does help kind of let you know who she is and it does inform the character going forward and she puts her hair up she puts her hair up yes she's let's get down to business <laughs> um. yeah exactly like that's the beginning of that trope the the big trope about women in action movies is in the end they need to go into an action ponytail and they need to wear a white tank top and those are the two things that you have to do to be an action Look, heroine. i won't complain about either sure <laughs> absolutely absolutely go nuts you know so uh the this ridley scott insisted on adding this final kind of secret last act to the movie originally the movie ended with ripley and the cat escaping the ship blowing up and Mm -hmm. that was it so ridley scott had the idea of adding this extra showdown where the alien is in the escape pod ripley is down to like the world's tiniest underwear and a tank (laughs) so so it's like the world's tiniest underwear as well not even be there like it was just like like shows half her ass crack yeah like and again, it's meant to emphasize how vulnerable she is at this moment. Like she doesn't even have clothes, like proper clothes to protect her with this creature that is lurking in here. Um, the creature is clearly like wounded or dazed or something because he's acting very slow. But it also reveals one of the cool secrets of this character design or this creature design, which is that it blends into the pipes. Mm-hmm. Like that happens in a couple of times in these movies. You mistake the alien for pipes. Um, and so we don't see that he's back there. So she needs to get into a suit and force this thing out of the airlock. And the first time I saw it, I was convinced that, like, she was firing the airlock and, like, oh, there's, like, four aliens coming out. There must yeah. have been so many more aliens. I'm like, oh, no, they're just reshowing the image of the same alien getting blown out. But it does help solidify Ripley's hero turn. It kind of lays the groundwork for what this character is going to become yeah. in the subsequent films. It shows that she is a fighter and she's not just, like, getting lucky or escaping by chance. And uh, you get this beautiful little moment of her doing the sign off, and uh, we get Jared Goldsmith's score playing over it. This score is so good. Yeah, by the, the score way. is like, really so good. So quiet and ominous, and like the boop, 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 boop. yeah, love it. And then, uh, and then you get the the fade out of just a, a lady and her cat. Just lady and her cat, just freezing the, themselves, and yeah, hopefully, in what you say, like six weeks or something, yeah. somebody will find her. Yes, yeah, which is every time she wakes up from one of these things, it's bad news for her. But we will get into that next week when we talk about aliens. aliens. Uh, I do want to switch the game, uh, the games, a little bit because um, this series, un- more than most other games, or most than, more than most other uh, series that we've covered, has more video game adaptations like within its extended universe than almost any other that we've covered. Um, because mostly these are tied in with the next movie because they have the Colonial Marines idea, which is very gametic. It's something you can really turn into a video game very easily. Uh, but this game does have two, or this movie does have two important games that we can talk about. Starting with the original Atari 2600 game, which came out in November of 1982, published and developed by Fox Video Games. Um, 
Defend, depending on your definition, this could be the very first video game tie-in movie. It came out right around the same time, maybe slightly before, as the Raiders of the Lost Ark game. There was a Superman game that came out in 1978, like roughly around the time that the movie came out, but it wasn't directly tied to the film, and it didn't really share any of the same imagery. So it was more of like a comic book game. So you could make the argument that this game is the beginning of all of it. Dun, dun, dun. And shockingly, it is a ripoff. <laughs> it is, uh, like many games around this time, it is just kind of a slightly reskinned version of another game. And I would argue this one gives us two slightly reskinned versions, uh, or re slightly reskinned versions of two different games. Each one, one of which is slightly worse than the original. The other one is significantly worse than the original. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would say that's fair. Um, so the level one of this is a Pac-Man knockoff. You're mm -hmm. walking around a maze, you're collecting dots, you're finding power pellets. And the alien designs themselves are actually very Pac-Man-like. They've got little jagged teeth, but they are seas with feet. And they're walking around. I love the design of it. It looks nothing like the movie, but I kind of love these little alien creatures in this. Uh, the difference, I think, between this and Pac-Man is that you have that extra button to use your flamethrower. But I don't think that does anything. I don't anything. think I ever used it. I don't think... I don't think it works. Yeah, I don't think it really um, does anything the, for An you. additional thing that they do that's a little interesting is that all of the power pellets are not there at first. Yeah. You have to use one, and then another one becomes a power yeah. pellet. Yeah, which is a slight variation on the formula, <laughs> yeah. at least. you know. But the mazes are going to look very similar. You've got a pipe on the end that like takes you around to the other side of the screen. It's a vent. It's a vent. vent. It's exactly a vent. It's no, a no, duct. it's a duct. It's yeah, a duct. 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 Yeah. Uh, you know, but it, you like you said, it's a Pac-Man knockoff, but it, as far as Pac-Man knockoffs go, it's not bad. It's functional. It's, right. it's doing yeah. exactly it's what all it right. is. It's not, it's not as fun as Pac-Man, though. No. Uh, yeah, but then level two becomes a there's no Waka Waka. Yeah, there's no Waka Waka. There's a Cruncha Cruncha. Um, but level two is a Frogger knockoff, which is, uh, again, I think both of these formats work for this movie. Like, the the first level you could argue is just the section where Dallas is wandering around in the vents trying to avoid the alien. You know, that kind of makes sense. And this one is, again, you just don't want this thing to touch you. But the problem is this is like a Frogger knockoff that only lets you go one direction. Frogger kind of works because you can go left, right, forward, and you can go back if you need to to work out your timing. This one you just got one shot to get through this in a, uh, a clean line, and we it's all pretty know. unforgiving. We all know that there's something wrong with one direction. Exactly. Ooh. Oh, shots fired 15 years ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's also the the biggest issue with the Frogger thing is that the spaces aren't big. No. Between the aliens, because it's just aliens coming from each side. There's no division between the lines. No, not really. So you are just, you aren't, unlike Frogger, where Frogger, you are moving on a grid, basically. You jump to the next, you jump, whatever. You are just walking along a straight line. It's not tied to the grid. Um, so sometimes it's hard to tell if you're going to get touched by this or that. Um, and also they don't come from the side of the screen. They come from like 20% in from the side of the screen. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have as much time to prepare. And so you can be waiting for a gap and then it appears like right next to you. And you're like, well, shit. All right. Uh, right. I don't. I physically can't yeah. make this now. No, it's uh, it's too narrow, and like the fact that you're not able to go back or move around, and, and it's just like a black screen with like I, colorful aliens. I think what it is intended to be is just a mini game in between to potentially get another life before mm -hmm. you go to the next round. I think so. Um, and then the next round is the same uh, arena as normal Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least Pac-Man had like some slight differences in the board yeah. styles. These yeah. seem to be identical. So maps. I don't know if. You, I don't know if it ever changes or what, because I you only made it to round two. Fair enough. Yeah, you know these are, these Atari don't games don't leave us a whole lot to talk about because they're very slight. They're always uh, very very rudimentary, and more often than not, my reaction is going to be, "Oh, it was fine." It was like fine. You I know. think I made it to three. You made it to three. Yeah, you definitely yeah. made it farther than I did, um, mostly because I lost interest. But <laughs> that tends to be the case with most of these Atari games. But we did have one other very interesting uh, game to talk about in conjunction with this movie. So uh, in 2014, we got a PS4 and Xbox One game called Alien Isolation. NPC, and PC thank you. Uh, and this is developed by Sega, and it is a survival horror game that's kind of a sequel to the first movie, but takes place before the events of the second one. 
Uh, in that game, you're taking control of Amanda Ripley, and you're going to explore this facility that has been overrun by aliens. It's one of the scariest games I've ever played, like bar none. I think it's such an intense game. They give you very few resources, almost no way to defend yourself against the alien. So it's a lot of sneaking and hiding and avoiding. And uh, it's got a really great sense of design. It's got the whole retro future thing going on with like all the padded walls. And like you have to dial like an old school payphone if you want to save your game. Little things like that. And that, I think that game is fantastic. It's over long. It's about a 25-hour game, which is too long to maintain that level of suspense. But overall, I think it's great, and I think it might be the best Alien game overall. And what the specific part we're going to be talking about is uh, it's a bit of DLC called Crew Expendable. And this takes place during the actual events of the first Alien movie. They got Sigourney Weaver, Yafet Kato, and Veronica Cartwright, and Tom Skerritt all came back to reprise their voices. And in this segment, you get to choose between Ripley, Parker, and Dallas as you go around trying to patch things up. So I think in the continuity of the movie, this is after the chestburster has come out of Kane. It's already killed Brett, um, but everyone else is still alive. And so... It's it would be the segment where Dallas is like exploring the ducks, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they kind of expand that out a little bit and uh, do a bit of the retcon. <laughs> it, this game is so difficult. It's really <laughs> difficult. We were having some troubles with it. Uh, like, like Justin pointed out, like this is a DLC for the other game. So it does expect that you remember how to play the main game, which I probably finished like six or seven years ago and haven't really touched since. So it was not very fresh to me. This is a game that requires a lot of patience, a lot of stealth, and a lot of uh, smart use of your tools. So you have a little tracker that you can use to kind of determine roughly where the alien is. If you're in its vicinity, you have to walk very, very slowly or find a good place to hide. (laughs) And even hiding is not a guarantee that you're not going to get found. Uh, I learned that the hard way. Getting into a locker and failing to hold your breath or duck when it walks by the grate will get you killed. so, yeah, the, the basic goal here is that we were supposed to be sent down into the pipes to try and seal off some of these gates, try and isolate the creature, and then we're trying to just kind of blast it out into the airlock. Uh, and I think J-Ban was the most successful I was the most successful. Um, it definitely went about as well for us as it did for them. Yeah, yeah, I would say. I would say <laughs> we have roughly the same survival rate. One strong woman is the only survivor <laughs> of, the, uh, of this Game and experience. Yeah, if you really count it down, the amount of times we died, I think we killed the entire crew. Yeah, yeah, at least uh, we might have. I mean, there's only seven people in the crew. We probably yeah. killed them several uh, times, times over. over yeah. Yeah. yeah, because, yeah, it, the game really just drops you right into it, and uh, you'll sometimes just be walking along, and if you're not paying attention to the music starting to swell, you'll just look down, and you've got a like tail sticking out of your chest. So that happened several times. They give you a flamethrower early on, but this so is... So ineffective. It's more functional as a flashlight than anything else. Like, because this thing is not really going to be startled <laughs> by that. We also didn't find a flashlight. There was a button in the controls to turn on the flashlight, and it did not work. So we were like, do we have to find a flashlight? Um, I, the I think it might have just been a flamethrower. If, yeah. you, if you torch them, uh, they flee. Yeah. Um, sometimes they might still knock you down, but they don't kill you, and then they flee. Oh, okay. Um, See, I was using the flamethrower, and it would still just get kill, me. Yeah, yeah, it would still just kill me. You, you had to get a solid hit, because I, I did it twice. Um, and then the third time, I was in a corner of a room crouching, going... You don't see me, please don't see me, please don't see me. And, and then, then when it finally, yeah. yeah, when yeah. it finally saw me, it was on me so goddamn quick yeah. that I didn't have time because you have to. The way you have to activate items is you normally just you have a wrench and that's all that's in your hands. Yeah, you have to hold down the corresponding button right. to pull out the tool, um, whether it's the motion tracker or the flamethrower, which are the only two things that we had mm-hmm. during the time that we were playing. Um, you have to pull open that. So, like, you have to hold, I think it was, like, left trigger or L2 to yeah. pull out the flamethrower. And then R2 to fire the flamethrower. And so that took a second. Yeah. And so there were multiple occasions where, oh, shit, we pulled out the wrong tool and got killed. Or, oh, no, we didn't pull out the flamethrower fast enough. 
Right. Um, yeah, and so uh, we were kind of stumbling through it yeah. a lot of ways. And, and, and the game is successfully trying to make you feel helpless against mm -hmm. this creature. The, like, the game did also have a few things through the points that we played that are like uh, – advanced tactics stuff of like here's some flares to use a distraction here's a radio you can turn on to use a distraction but we didn't know what we were doing well enough to make use of it yet yeah um i think i steve tried to use it make use of it but i don't know how well that worked the radio um i definitely turned it on and then was like Oh no! And then turned it back off, and then was quickly found. <laughs> <laughs> and, so. you, and you always get such a great like death scene anytime it finds you, depending on which angle it's coming at you. Sometimes you'll just be looking down the barrel as it spits out its inner mouth at you, and sometimes yeah. it'll stab you from behind. Uh, mm -hmm. And then J Band got killed in the vents or ducts, and it was a different. Uh, they, there's a few different ways yeah. that we died. Yeah, it didn't necessarily get boring. It just got. Annoying, frustrating, frustrating. Yeah, because we were, we're like, God damn it. Because yeah, we were we were dying a lot, and I've found that with myself. Like, I used to be really into stealth games, like your Metal Gear Solid or your Splinter Cell, things like that. And I think I've completely lost patience for mm -hmm. that style of gameplay. I have a hard time moving slowly in games and like hiding in shadows and waiting for something to get by. When I played this game, I was still in that mode and I was able to get on board with it. But that I think I, I've encountered something similar and it might be my ADHD tightening up or something. But uh, cause I used to play like Splinter Cell, Hitman, all of that. And then yeah. I would like take forever to do everything perfectly. Yeah. And then as an adult, I'm just like, Nah, I'm just going to shoot him. <laughs> is there a chainsaw option? I want to run through and chainsaw everybody. You know, just, just let me go through. Yeah, and, but I, I think this game really does capture the tone of the movie. I think if we're talking about this as a tie-in. Uh, oh, you guys be good. I hear you barking. Yeah, back off. Gunther heard a neighbor close the door. Little alien monsters. Yeah, every time. But yeah, I think it really captures the vibe. Cute. Oh, yeah, that one's cute. Yeah, Rivet, you're cute. Gunther's cute, too. Gunther, you're not. He's got some... He's a bit of a chonky he's boy. A, he's a chonkster. Um, but yeah, I, I I think it really captures the vibe of the movie. I think it really gets the look of it exactly mm -hmm. right and the tension of it. You yeah, know, you it should, definitely gets the tension. You should never feel like you are of an equal strength of this alien monster. And it needs to be enough that there's just one of them on here to like really strike yes. fear in your heart. Um, and to, to add, throw some details on, uh, the game looks pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's almost it 10 years old. It still looks great. It's almost 10 years old. Uh, were we playing on a PS5? Uh, yeah, well, I, I was using the PS4 disc in the PS5. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it was a PS4 game. And so uh, if you play on PC, it might even be better than that. Um, probably push the limitations of the console quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so it looked good. The controls felt good. I th the, my pet peeve was just that you had to hold a button to pull out the thing. Um, it but again, seems... it's it's meant to make you feel helpless, you know. So you have to yeah. choose: yeah. like, do you want to know where it is, or do you want to be prepared to defend yeah. yourself? Um, and I think if if <laughs> if we played the first game from the start, it would feel better because then we'd go through like the tutorial ish area of like you know how to learn how to do all these yeah. things, and we'd get more used to it. And, you know, you do, from what I recall, like, I definitely struggled with the main game for a little bit, like, trying to get on board with the mechanics of it. And once you lock into it a bit, mm -hmm. you, you'll really start cruising through. I think we were starting to get it towards the end, Eric. At least I was. Yeah. You were. You I were was. definitely, yeah. You were You were uh, the more patient of the three of us, I think. So you were <laughs> able to get through that a little better. Look, there's multiple occasions where I heard uh, footsteps, and I made a guess as to whether or not those footsteps had passed, and uh, they hadn't. I guess so. Right. Yeah, hey. Um, happens. Or I'm like, okay, I think they went past, and I go to walk towards the door, and the door opens, and I'm like, I don't see it. I guess but not. But it's got to be there. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you had to use the tracker. Yeah. But I did love just being dropped into this movie that I love so much yeah. and like getting to play this little segment of it because it is still, like I said, this series has a ton of media attached to it, a ton of video games, but not many are attached to this very, very first game. So I think it's a cool idea to go back to that style and build a whole game around it. And uh, overall, I think it's really great. Yeah. Um, I think that's about all I've got about uh, the original Alien. I probably could go on all day if I need to rein myself in because we still have three more Alien movies that we're going to be talking about 
over the next couple of weeks. So let's move on to our rankings of uh, is this a good movie, good game, or to a bad movie, bad game, or somewhere in between. Uh, Justin, why don't you kick us off today? Because this is your first time viewing of this movie, so I'm excited to hear your take. Yeah, I I had seen uh, Prometheus. Uh-huh. Um, and so, and I was also obviously, the, the pop culture of the chest burster and stuff, like, it's hard to have play, played sci-fi games and been so into sci-fi for so long without knowing some of those tropes already. Oh, yeah. So um, this, this movie has fingerprints, like, on every yeah. piece of sci-fi um, media that's come I've since. seen an Alien versus Predator at some point. Mm. Um, uh, I think it was a good movie. Um, I'm excited to see what comes next. Yeah. Uh, now that we... We've established the alien, mm -hmm. and we know more about what it can do. Um, we probably don't know everything it can do, but we're probably going to get there. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think the game was fun. Um, the Atari game was okay. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, things have changed quite a while, but if eh. you want to play a Pac-Man clone, it's not bad. It's quaint. It's got um, cute little number munchers. And then, yeah, know? Alien Isolation. Obviously, we, we weren't good at it. We didn't do super well, but we were definitely feeling it. Yeah. Um, and I think if this was a game that you were playing, like, solo with the lights out, uh, kind of at night, it yeah. would be a, a great experience. Scared the piss uh, out of the me. The visuals <laughs> look great. The, uh, the alien looks good. Uh, it's absolutely daunting to turn down a hallway and see this big hulking fucking behemoth at the end of it and be like, He's well, <laughs> so fast. He is so fast. If he sees you, you're pretty much dead. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Good time. Uh, J-Ban, where are you at? Uh, great movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we didn't talk much about the fact that it's like a slasher in space. And I yeah. love slashers. Yeah. Uh, and it's just so smart and well done. And um, like the people are people, but they're likable mm -hmm. and they don't make stupid mistakes. They make differing choices. Uh, but they like like I said last week with Blair Witch, what annoys me is when people make really poor decisions. It feels like in this, people were making generally smart decisions or complicated decisions at least. Uh, and then for the reasons that like breaking quarantine, we find out that there's a whole reason behind that because of Ash as an Android. Yeah. Um, and so I just like, it's such a smart, such a fun movie. Um, so freaky and like dark and devious um such a great movie uh video game wise i think the atari is i don't want to say bad because it's functional sure uh but it's it's, it's okay it's okay it's okay it's better than um, the blues brothers and game. Yeah. it's better than the blues brothers game um and um like it again it is functional uh which is sometimes all you could ask for yeah um and then the um alien isolation game i thought it was really like very beautiful to look at very fun um like it definitely had this learning curve of getting killed quite quickly uh but i i liked it i could play it for hours yeah. i think yeah i i would encourage you to check out the the main game i think you would really like it if you uh if, if you liked the little taste that you got there i would check that out and yeah. i'm i'm pretty open about where i stand with this this is a this movie's a 10 out of 10 masterpiece it's one of my favorites of all time uh, I think it's just gets better and more rewarding with every rewatch. Like even with the countless, countless, countless imitators, uh, it has never been fully topped uh, in terms of like what this movie's trying to accomplish. And uh, yeah, I, I feel the same about both games. I enjoy the Guitar one enough just because all I needed to do is like have a cute little alien design, which it has. Like I enjoy the little C cr number cruncher looking monster. And Alien Isolation, I think, is a fantastic <clears throat> game. It uh, uh, takes a little bit to lock into its very particular style. But once you do, uh, you'll have a really great time. And it's one of the scarier games that I've ever played all the way through. So definitely check that out. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. We are going to continue this Alien train for the rest of the month of November. I am so excited about it. Next week, we are talking about the sequel, 1986's Aliens, directed by James Cameron. Uh, an absolute action masterpiece and a very mm. different vibe from this movie while still being of a piece of the series and just a, a thrilling piece of cinema on its own. So I'm really excited to get into that. I'm excited for Justin to see that one. I think you're going to love that movie. Uh, and uh, we'll, I'll try and narrow down which game we're going to talk about because there's <laughs> probably like a dozen different alien alien colonial marines video games. But we'll, we'll narrow it down. I'll pick a good one and we'll, uh, we'll talk about it from there.
Okie dokie, artichokey. All right, everyone. Well, we will see you next time. And remember, in space, no one can hear you podcast. So, I don't know. We might want to go to space, honestly. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye,